Welcome to Beat Diabetes. I'm Dennis Pollock, and today we're going to talk about a couple of different uh, experiments that are very, very powerful, and they're from this book, Protein Power. I know I've reviewed it in the past, but I don't think I talked about these particular experiments recently. Uh, actually, it started uh, the, th me thinking about it when a lady uh, who's teaching a nursing class sent me an email, and she was wondering if I had uh, any information about the dog experiment. And I, I found it in this book, and so I, I sent her an email and gave her uh, a, a photocopy of the page that talked about that dog experiment. I thought, well, you know, I haven't shared that in years. Uh, and uh, then I thought about one other experiment that is uh, equally powerful. So I thought, well, uh, for today, this Tuesday, uh, if you're watching it when it first comes out, uh, we're going to talk about two experiments that are incredibly powerful uh, to describe what happens when you are overdosing on insulin. And you can overdose on insulin two different ways. One would be if you're injecting insulin and you're just taking just all kinds of insulin to try to keep up with your high carb diet. Now, that's going to be an overdose. Another way is you can naturally overdose on insulin when you've got hyperinsulinemia. Your own pancreas is putting it out, but it's putting out way too much. And you're just living with constantly surging insulin. Your body's being flooded with insulin day after day. And that's not good. It's not healthy. Insulin you need for sure, but you don't need boatloads of it. So anyway, let's get to the dog experiment first. And uh, he, uh, this is by Dr. Mary and uh, Dr. Michael and Mary Eads, husband and wife team. And he talks about a, a, a doctor, a researcher named Dr. Anatolio Cruz. But what he did was he decided we're going to inject dogs in the leg, in the hindquarters, with small amounts of insulin, not major amounts, because you could do a dog in by major amounts of anything or do a human in by giving them too much, but just small amounts of insulin, but it would be every day. And they did it for almost eight months. So on one side of the dog, one of the legs, the dog gets small amounts of insulin every day. And on the other leg, just to kind of balance it out, they give this, the dogs salt, a salt uh, injection, salt solution. And after about eight months, they check to see what has happened to these dogs' arteries and interior part of their legs after eight months of insulin on one side and eight months of salt on the other. So here is what they found out. It says, upon examination, the arteries injected with the insulin were found to have a pronounced accumulation of cholesterol and fatty acids along with a thickening of the inner arterial lining. Their arteries got thick. They got hardening of the arteries in about eight months. The opposite arteries, says Dr. Eads, injected with saline remained normal. So the salt didn't have any effect on them. But boy, that insulin sure did. Which and really, that's the whole point of this book is just the incredible damage it does you when you've got too much insulin. And of course, the word we use these days is hyperinsulinemia. You've just got way too much insulin, something that would be perfect in small amounts doing its job quietly behind the scenes. But when it's in big amounts, it's terrible. It's kind of like the difference between a flood and a gentle rain. Rain we need. If it stopped raining in our world, uh, we'd all die after a while and everything would dry up. But we don't need floods. So when you hear about a flood and, and houses are being washed away and people are dying like crazy, uh, that's not good. And that's kind of the difference between smaller amounts of insulin that are doing a perfect job. You got to have it. Ask a type one if you're not sure about that. They've got to have that insulin. So they inject it. Small amounts, perfect. Huge amounts, uh, not good at all. And so uh, he goes on to make this statement. He says, with this in mind, it's not difficult to imagine the changes in our own coronary arteries after many years of chronic hyperinsulinemia. If you can do that to a dog in eight months and give him all kinds of fatty deposits and hardening of the arteries in eight months time, and it wasn't even big amounts of insulin, just small amounts, 
Well, what's going to happen to us when we are living with surging hyperinsulinemia? So that's experiment number one, or the first one I'm going to mention. The second one actually is more toward the beginning of the book, and this has to do with a researcher by the name of Karen O'Day, a lady, Australian physician. And she was interested in diabetes, and she had a particular interest in the Aborigines. So she found a group of Aborigines that were all overweight, diabetic, but it's because they had moved into the city and adopted city ways and city eating. And so they were no longer eating their natural diet, which would have been the case had they been out in the wilderness the way many Aborigines live. So she, the, she took these city Aborigines and she got some of them, a group of them, to agree to go back to the wild, back to the wilderness, and eat their normal diet they had grown up with, which was kangaroo meat, crickets, slugs, snails, whatever you can find, basically. But they were all diabetic. And when they went back, she, she got them to agree to live that way for seven weeks, 49 days. They're going to live like they had lived before. And she describes it as hunter gathers rather than eating carbohydrates and grains and bread and pasta. They're going to eat the way they had before, which was a much heavier emphasis on protein and fat and far less carbohydrates. So city diet, they're all diabetic. They're all overweight. They're all a mess. Seven weeks living out in the wild, living out in the wilderness. And guess what? They lose their diabetes. She says the diet varied with protein ranging from 54 to 80%. So they're eating more protein than anything else. And then would come fat. And at the very bottom of the list, dietarily, while they're out in the, in the bush, carbs was the lowest. The exact opposite of how they had been living and eating in the city. So what happened? Their blood glucose levels fell from an average of about 210, very, very much diabetic, 210 milligrams per deciliter to 118, almost cut in half by seven weeks out in the bush, eating snails and kangaroo and fish and whatever they could, could get. Insulin levels dropped almost by half from 23 to 12 mu per milliliter, whatever that is, very close to the normal range. Triglycerides dropped as well, fell by a factor of three from 354 to about 106. Triglycerides took a nosedive. Everything looked better and it came in seven weeks. And interestingly enough, she reported that it wasn't because they were out there constantly walking and running and jumping and they were far more uh, involved in terms of activity. She said, we actually figured out they were slightly less active out in the bush than they were in the city. Don't ask me why. It doesn't explain in this book. You'd think they would be more active, but somehow... Dr. O'Day said, no, they actually were slightly less active, and yet everything improved that was reported. Went from diabetic to non-diabetic. And so if you ask, is this group of Aborigines, this was in the 1980s, by the way, it's been quite a while, but you can, can look it up. If you ask, is this group of people, are they diabetic? The answer would be, well, it depends on where they live and how they eat. If they live in the city and eat city food, which is a preponderance of carbohydrates, then yep, they're diabetic. But if you put them in the bush, in the wild, in the wilderness, and let them forage for food and become like hunter-gatherers once again, in seven weeks' time, they're not diabetic. Now, you may say, okay, that's an interesting experiment, but I'm not Aborigines. I've never been to Australia. It doesn't relate to me. Yes, it does, my friend, because the issue is not whether you're eating a kangaroo, kangaroo meat and snails versus a lot of bread 
and rolls and donuts. The issue is what's your percentage of protein and fat to your percentage of carbohydrates? If your carbs are the biggest thing you eat, which is what the food pyramid told us deceitfully for years, biggest hoax ever put placed on Americans and pretty much the world in terms of diet. But if carbs are the number one thing you eat, then you fit with these Aborigines city dwellers. You've got problems. It may take 20 years, 30 years, 40 years for them to show up in your life, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. It may take some time, but it's likely to show up. But if you can change the protein and the fat ratio to where that's what you're eating mostly and far less carbs, then suddenly within weeks or months, maybe at most six months to eight months, maybe a year for some stubborn cases, suddenly you're not diabetic according to the numbers. Now, I know people will argue, well, yeah, you really are diabetic, but you've just managed to avoid it somehow. But however you want to say it, when your protein and fat levels go up and your carbohydrate levels go down, it doesn't take very long for your numbers to change. Your triglycerides, your glucose levels, your insulin levels, all the stuff that's hurting you and giving you neuropathy and causing your eyes to fail and causing the doctor to say, we may have to cut off that foot or we may have to cut off that leg. All the stuff that's a problem for you medically and in your health can go away by the percentage of what you eat. And the reality is sugars and carbs and starches are destroying your health, my friend. And the quicker you move to that other diet where protein and fat is elevated and carbs are demoted, the better you will be. If you followed our ministry and YouTube channels very long, you know that we're involved in many different missions and ministries. We sponsor our popular African Jesus Conference, which is a video series of 20 different video Bible studies and teachings to train African ministers about the paramount importance of teaching and preaching Jesus, as well as personally abiding in Jesus. Benedict and I create YouTube videos of our Bible studies, and we also produce audio podcasts of these studies. I teach a weekly video devotional on all kinds of Bible topics. We sponsor free medical clinics in Africa, along with providing needed food and clothes for African widows and orphans. We need your help. Please consider donating through our link in the description below this video.